How do I sum up postural neurology in a quick video? <laughs> in the original Bulletproof Backs course, I almost had another course within the course, which was taking you through the process of how to assess your own eyes, your own feet, your own ears, and your own jaw. And as I've evolved the method, I've realized that that part is best done being assessed by a practitioner and it's best done for those that feel their sensory inputs are definitely playing into their back pain situation. It's not relevant for everyone. And I guess the idea of this video is to help you understand if it is relevant for you and your back pain situation. I've in the previous lesson, mentioned and shouted out to Annette Vermelot. Her YouTube channel is great. There's so much educational content on there. And I think if you just went there and looked at her videos, your level of education would expand a lot. She also gives you very practical ways to assess and then to treat some of these mismatched inputs. But if we keep it really simple, when I'm assessing the inputs, as mentioned, we look at eyes. We look particularly at whether you have a dominant eye, whether both eyes can work around all the angles of a clock face without your head moving. So if I'm doing things like every time I take my eyes to the left, my head turns, can I hold my head still and have all my eye muscles work? We also look at things like convergence. If I look at my finger and bring it towards my nose, hopefully my two eyes converge equally. As an example, if your eye inputs are not balanced, how that could possibly cause back pain. This is where the leap needs to be made for most people. It's logical that if you have an eye issue that you very logically and rationally think, well, that's got nothing to do with my back pain. And sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it really does. I think it's easier to talk about it in context of a neck so if we think about a dominant eye, let's say my right eye is way more dominant than my left. What my brain tends to do is it deviates so that this eye can provide more information to my brain than the weaker one. Over time, that means I tend to walk around with a slightly rotated neck. And if my neck rotates, then is a compensation below in our skeletal structure. Usually the pelvis follows the head, which means a twisted neck can be a twisted pelvis, which means a twisted pelvis does make some of your vertebrae, discs, joints, muscles more vulnerable to strain and counter strain because its default position is not balanced and facing forward. If we unkink the neck, the pelvis is more likely to find a new, more neutral alignment. That's one example. When we start looking at the next sensory input, which is our ears, we have a vestibular system, inner ear canals that move in three different directions, which give feedback about the three planes of motion. And I have a I have an image about that in one of the next lessons. So don't worry if that sounds a bit crazy. But essentially, our ears provide information to our brain about where this body is in space. If we have movements within our semicircular canals of the fluid that's not balanced, maybe one's spinning quicker, one's stuck, one's blocked, we all know how we move if we have um, vertigo. Try moving with vertigo. 
tell me how great you feel. Try moving on a boat or try moving with seasickness and experiencing how overstimulation of your inner ear canals can create havoc within your body. So when we're testing that, I do some really simple tests with eyes closed to test are both ears giving the information balanced inputs in every direction? And often we find they're not. And often I find that if an ear input is implicated, we usually have a tilt of the head, something like this arrangement. And when we have this arrangement in the head, you can understand in the neck that would create a lot of compression on one side of my neck and a lot of length on the other side, which if it's repeated day in and day out, makes these tissues vulnerable to overstretch, but makes these joints vulnerable to wearing out arthritic changes because the joint space is narrowed. That same effect applies down into the pelvis. When I have a head tilt, I tend to have a pelvic tilt, which creates all the same patterns of unequal force distribution down in the pelvis. Often we can change it in the pelvis, but if someone's still walking around with their head a little bit kinked, then it very rarely unlocks in the pelvis. Moving down, the jaw, a simple way to know if your jaw is possibly not set correctly is when you open your mouth, do the center of the teeth open and close centrally or do they deviate or is it an overbite or an underbite? All of those link to what your pelvis is doing also in 3D space. Correcting the pelvis can help correct the jaw, but it works the other way. Correcting the jaw can help correct the pelvis. And I, I guess it's like thinking of our systems of movement like a computer you know, when we tweak a computer and we change one input here, it has a different output there. We are electrical beings and these impulses that go into the brain and get processed create an output which affects how this 3D structure aligns itself in vertical space. By looking at someone, you can have a rough idea that inputs are out. Rotation can indicate eyes, head tilt can indicate ears, Looking at jaw mechanics obviously can indicate the jaw as a bit of an issue. And then finally, when we go right down, we come to the feet. Now, I want you to remember there's more. Skin is a sensory driver to the brain. I guess I'm focusing on the big ones, but there's always more. And I'm trying to keep it simple. <laughs> I'm trying to make a very complicated process simple. Feet are your two areas of contact of the body they're the only points that come into contact with the ground. Everything has to be stacked on them evenly. If they're not, if your body weight is not stacked on your feet evenly, the feet will demonstrate that. A good indicator can be that you wear down one side of your shoe. It could be that you have um, you keep rolling your ankle on one side because the pelvis is kind of leaning off to one side. The pelvis might be too far forward, causing your toes to grip. The pelvis might be almost falling backwards, causing your hamstrings and calves to always be tight. The body is always working to keep its center of gravity nice and central within its base of support. And the feet form the base of support. When they point really wide out and they're wide, we've broadened our base of support. When our feet are narrow and together, we've narrowed our base of support. And every person uses very different compensations to navigate how it moves its center of gravity through space. You only have to look at how people walk. <laughs> There's so many variations on walking. Effectively, everyone's getting one foot in front of the other most of the time. But how they do it, in the sequence they do it, with where things are orientated as they do it with are they swinging their arms not swinging their arms how much does their pelvis shift to one side or the other do they look up do they look down do they do it with a bit of a head rotation we all have very different movement patterns and our movement patterns directly influence our tissue stresses if you keep hurting your body in one spot 
it's great feedback from the body that that spot is copying a lot of stress. And usually the places that hurt are the places that are being asked to overwork or overcompensate for some part somewhere else that's doing nothing. And so we can strengthen our bodies, we can stretch them, but they will always find their way back to their patterns if the neurology or the electrical outputs that drive them are not balanced. So long ago, I stopped taking that old approach. I could stretch, I could stretch someone's neck and they come back in the next week still facing in the opposite direction. I could, you know, sort out their head tilt in one session, but then they come back and they're straight back there because the neurology hadn't been addressed. We can correct and crack and align someone's pelvis but then if they go and move the same old way, that pelvis is going to find its way directly back to where it started. And this, I think, explains why we get relief, but then it, the problem comes back. Because we haven't got, and this is becoming a very common fa phrase, we haven't got to the root of the problem. And it's interesting what some people consider the root of the problem. I saw a video the other day which talked about uh, the hip flexors were the root of the problem because they were really short and really tight. And so this person was putting a lot of emphasis on lengthening and opening up the hip flexors, which is a common back pain idea. But the next question for me is, but why are they tight? Why are they short? Why do I need to keep stretching them out? And I then go to where is the pelvis located on the feet? Because that's what will keep the tensions around my back or hips locked as they are. What keeps my pelvis where, you know, if it's shifted or too far forward or too far back, what keeps it there? Sensory inputs, creating sensory outputs. And particularly in our feet, the skin on the soles of your feet is, is so sensory rich it provides more information to your brain than your eyes and your ears combined. So when our feet are encased in thick-soled shoes, then our brain is kind of flying blind a little bit on information coming from the ground up. And so it's very easy to get knees hips and pelvis is out of alignment because our feet, unfortunately, most of us, our feet aren't getting the sensory stimulation required to give quality inputs to the brain. Shoes are a big culprit. People just simply not going barefoot anymore, not feeling hot, cold, rough, smooth and uneven surfaces, which are the stimulators of the sensory receptors in your feet, which gives the quality of information to your brain. So I guess the nice thing about knowing postural neurology is that it's not common knowledge. I remember discovering it and it was my aha moment. There's been many of them, by the way. I got frustrated that we weren't taught at, at physiotherapy. I still get frustrated at still not being taught at a physiotherapy undergraduate uh, level. If I'm wrong about that, please let me know. We know so much now about the nervous system and about neurology, and yet we're still teaching the same old shit. And it frustrates the crap out of me because I do think it keeps so many people locked in dysfunctions that don't need to be in dysfunctions. That's my little rant for the moment. And again, I'm going off track. The object of this video is to have you Open your eyes to the fact that what your head is doing is affecting your pelvis. What your feet are doing is affecting your pelvis. What your jaw is doing is affecting your pelvis. What your vestibular balance system is doing is affecting your pelvis. And that if we want your pelvis to be free, centered, and able to move in all eight directions well, then all the influences above and below can be fine-tuned and optimised to help that. Your back pain, I talk about the pelvis because those five vertebrae sit on your pelvis. They're the foundation for your vertebrae for your back. And we can keep treating that sore bit, but that sore bit does not exist in its own system. It is, 
it, it's not in isolation of the system. It's directly influenced by all around it. And so broadening your assessment, broadening your perspectives is really important to getting the skeletal structure aligned so that the damaged tissue can have less stress, better load patterns, and with that, a greater ability to actually heal. It's very hard to heal something that keeps copying it. And it's not about strength and flexibility always. It's about the electrical outputs coming from the brain to get ourselves lined up. I hope that helps. Uh, as I said, I've put an invitation in there. If you feel these sensory inputs are part of your back pain situation, then get them assessed. It's quite easy to do with a practitioner online. And depending on what comes up, will depend on the movement prescription we give. The movement prescription usually has components to it that stimulate the eyes, the ears, the feet and the jaw all at once. So it's a bit like going into the electrical system and saying, here's the glitch, we're going to really stimulate it until it comes back online. And when we do that, the system moves differently. When you move differently, things that were weak start to strengthen, things that were tight start to lengthen, and you've done it from the motor cortex level. You've just altered the bit that wasn't, the missing part has been reintroduced. And that, to me, is our goal with how we move in our spines, particularly as we age. We want to move well and we want to move with quality. When we do that, we move more naturally. So we stay stronger, we stay, we stay fitter. As I said, the thing I see most people in back pain getting wrong is trying to strengthen something that's not aligned well. And in my vision of how the body works, we're actually locking in some pretty bad dysfunction when we get something strong that is not lined up well because you're locking it in. And I don't like that. I would rather align something first, make sure it can move freely in all directions, and then add that layering of strength and stability. But adding it before it's lined up just seems a little bit counterintuitive to me. Just my opinion. So ask yourself, do my eyes work really well? Do they converge? Is there a dominance? Can they move through those angles without me turning my head? Do I have any history of vestibular imbalance? Can I balance on one leg with my eyes closed? Um, do I get seasick? Ah. Uh, if I close my eyes and march on the spot, do I end up in the same spot or do I kind of drift around the room aimlessly? They can all be indicators that your vestibular system could do with a tune-up. Think about your jaw. Are you grinding? Do you have TMJ? Does your dentist constantly say you're wearing down your teeth? Can you see when you bite the only chew on one side of your mouth? They can all be indicators. And finally, when it gets down to your feet, look at your shoes are they worn? Do you have pain in any area of your feet? Can you walk on uneven surfaces freely and easily? What's the sensitivity of the soles like? All of those things can be indicators that there's room for improvement. And I encourage you to have yourself assessed by a qualified postural neurologist and then get your prescriptions and then retune your motor cortex Neurology retraining is quite a quick process. It's a neuroplastic process. So it takes, sometimes I've seen it happen really quickly in seven days. Other times it seems to take up to 30 days. Again, it's dependent on how frequently you stimulate it. And if you stimulate it from a space of fun, uh, happiness versus a space of, oh my God, I've got to do these exercises. That takes longer. So yeah, get it checked out if you think it's relevant for you. If not, Move on.